bleed. Amen. You may be seated. Good singing. <clears throat> Open your Bibles, the book of Acts, chapter 27. We're thankful for each of you that are in the service tonight. And uh, it's difficult for me to believe that if the Lord should stay His coming, tomorrow night will be my last night in the meeting. Of course, the meeting is running all the way through Sunday night, but uh, tomorrow night will be my last night, and I've just enjoyed, and I'll say more about it if the Lord should stay, <clears throat> if the Lord should stay His coming, I'll say more about it tomorrow night, but I've enjoyed these uh, handful of days that I've had the privilege of being here at the Grace Baptist Church. And so uh, let's be in our place tomorrow night. I do not normally announce what I'm going to preach before I preach it, but uh, the Lord being my sweet helper tomorrow night, I will preach on the subject, America in the shadow of Calvary. You'll want to be in the service tomorrow night. It is a message, Brother Tate, that, uh, oh, I've been preaching in my meetings all this year, and the Lord has blessed it a great way, and I want you to be, I want you to be in the service tomorrow night. In fact, uh, Brother Barron, if I had to miss a night, I'd miss tonight. <laughs> I would. I wouldn't even come Tuesday night. I'd just skip, lay out. I'd miss. Now, you're here, so you might as well stay. But I want you to be in your place tomorrow night and do your best to bring someone with you. Book of Acts, chapter 27, and I'll take but one verse of Scripture for our text, and it will be... <clears throat> it will be verse number 44. Book of Acts chapter 27 and verse number 44. And I would invite you to stand with me as I read the Word of God. I appreciate uh, the great job <clears throat> that uh, Brother Tom is uh, doing in leading the singing. And I appreciate the fellows up in the in the crow's nest. God bless you, fellas. In fact, let's everybody turn around and wave at them. Can you do that? They're up there in the crow's nest. That's the bachelor pad up there. They got a lava lamp and they got a popcorn maker and uh, ESPN one, two, and three. And they're not listening to preaching. They, they got uh, checkers tuned in up there. And uh, fellas, you've been doing a great job. And I made a mental note to uh, thank those that are watching by way of internet. There's no telling, really, big statement, no telling the reach of this revival meeting. And there are people literally on the other side of the world that are tuning in and watching by way of Internet. And so we want to welcome those that uh, are watching and will watch. And let me just say that if you'll send us $5, we'll send you a vial of holy water. <laughs> Oh, I've always wanted to do that. I've always wanted to do that. Book of Acts, chapter 27, <coughs> and I'll take but one verse of Scripture for our text, and it will be verse number 44. I remember hearing, oh, many, many years ago, one of my heroes, Dr. Lee Robertson, and Dr. Robertson said in my hearing that if he had to do his ministry all over again, now this is Dr. Lee Robertson, they called him the Charles Haddon Spurgeon of his day. They called him Velvet Steel. And Dr. Lee Robertson said in my hearing, if I had to do my ministry all over again, he said, Brother Robert, I would preach more encouraging sermons. Dr. Robertson said that. You know, from time to time, the people of God need messages of strength, and solace and stanima. Some would have us believe that every time a preacher stands to preach, they all skin people. I've never believed that. In fact, if you skin anything, you're going to kill it. I don't believe in skinning people when I preach. On the heels of that, let me say that I do believe in shearing the sheep awfully close, but I don't believe in skinning them. And so with the help of the Lord, I want to try to, uh, oh, bowl down that alley and make that uh, the bullseye and try to preach an encouraging truth. Because from time to time, no matter who you are, 
from time to time, the people of God need Amen. encouragement. You say, well, Dr. Ham, when I, I never get discouraged. Well, I want you to see me at the book table after the service because I want you to sign my Bible. And when I get back to my motel room late tonight, before I pillow my head, I'll go to the fly leaf and where you signed it, I'll write underneath it the signature and life first of the biggest liar I've ever met as I've been on the revival road. All of us, every, <coughs> every single one of us needs from time to time encouragement. And I'm praying that will happen in this service tonight. Now, if you've not found the book of Acts, chapter 27, by now, man, I've given you a boatload of time. If you've not found it, then you stop wherever you are in that hymn book and you pretend that hymn book. I'll let you catch up. You pretend that you're in the book of Acts, chapter 27 and verse 44. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. There is in this verse a handful of words that I wish tonight should underline, if not in your Bibles, then certainly in your minds. I've underscored it in my Bible, and it's that handful of words, and so it came to pass. Do you see it? There it is, and so it came to pass to pass. And for a few moments, I want to speak to you on the subject tonight, one phrase that'll get you through all the storms of life. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this privilege to stand behind a sacred desk to preach the Word of God if I know my heart, I want to be a blessing. But the only way that I can be is if you hide me behind the cross and fill me with the Spirit. Place a hedge around this great church by the blood of Christ to keep the devil and his demons from hindering this service. Save the sinner and stir the saint. Heavenly Father, for all that you'll do in our midst and even in our hearts tonight, we will be careful to give you all the praise and honor and glory. Bless and protect my precious family as I'm away. Give us fresh warm bread from the oven of heaven to feed from tonight. Lord, I'd request, oh, how I would request that you'd clothe me in my calling. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. During the spiritual existence of every saint of God, there's going to be the serious event of a terrible tempest. The Bible is not only a handbook on salvation, but it's also an instruction manual on storms. And it states how the believer can survive all the swells and surges on the sea of their life, ministry, and walk with God. The tempest does not have to be the child of God's tombstone. One phrase that'll get you through all the storms of life. In the book of Acts, chapter 27, we find the Apostle Paul's sea voyage. Now, this chapter could be uh, easily, oh, or effortlessly, uh, outline like this, the centur centurion's consideration, verses 1 through 3. The cautious concern, verses 4 through 12. The complete collapse, verses 14 through 20. The Christian's confidence, verses 21 through 26. The captain's command, verses 27 through 32. 
the cheerful company, verses 33 through 38, and then the certain creek, verses 39 through 44. It is well the physician Luke is dealing under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit with the certain creek that a person sees the single phrase, the single phrase that a person sees, Brother Tate, <coughs> the single phrase for all the storms of their passage. Verse 44, and so it came to pass. Evangelist Oliver B. Green, God bless his sainted memory, once wrote about our text, they all, the 276 souls, escaped a watery grave in the Mediterranean because of the providence of Almighty God. Then he tied up his thought by simply writing a remarkable instance of divine care of many in order to save one of God's servants. The sister verse of Acts 27, 44, uh, is 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, 10. And as you've heard me say already several times in this meeting, uh, every verse in the Bible has what I call a sister verse, and often that sister verse will throw more light on the verse that you're musing, meditating, or making a study of. Again, the sister verse of Acts 27, 44, is 2 Corinthians 1.10, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Never forget, if just one servant of God made it through his physical storm, then every saint of God, Brother Robert, can make it through their spiritual storms. Now, if you miss everything that I preach tonight, I pray that you will not miss that, and it even bears repeating, if just one, if just one, if just one servant of God made it through his physical storm, then every saint of God can make it through their spiritual storms. Friend, you and I, of those of us that are saved, I can see the conclusion, and so it came to pass of our calamity. Now quickly tonight, there are 10. There are 10 practical nuts and bolts things the believer can do to see the termination of their tempest, and they're all found here in Acts chapter 27. Let's quickly notice it tonight, and you may want to take out a pencil and somewhere in your Bible scratch these things down, but my, how it would be far better if God were to take an eternal pen and write these things upon my heart and upon your heart as well. A uh, one phrase that'll get you through all the storms of life. Someone says, well, there you fundamentalists go again, oversimplifying things. Well, Brother Teat, I don't know. <coughs> I, don't, I don't know if we oversimplify things or not, but I do know you stinking liberals overcomplicate things all the time. So quickly, uh, let's notice 10 nuts and bolts things that we can do right now, that we can plug into our lives right now, that we can accomplish right now, that'll help us through the tempest of this life. Quickly, let's notice it tonight as they're all found here in Acts chapter 27. Number one, have prayer. Verse 21, but after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them. A practical thing the believer can do to see the termination of their tempest is have prayer. In verse 21, the physician Luke tells us that the apostle Paul, uh, after sensing the severity of the situation, goes straight to supplication. If a person would step into a time machine and stand outside the cabin door of the Moses of the New Testament and press their ear to that entrance, they would hear him softly and sweetly singing, Ah, oh, from every stormy wind that blows, 
from every swelling tide of woe. There is a calm, a sure retreat. Tis found beneath the mercy seat. Friend, you and I can see the conclusion of our calamity. And so it came to pass when we have prayer. Mark it down when in a storm, don't first look, oh, for a life jacket, but look for a prayer closet. Oh, there's something you and I can do when we're in a tempest. There's something you and I can do when we're in trouble and we find it from the testimony of the Apostle Paul. And what we can do, Brother Tom, is we can have prayer. The superintendent of a large factory wanted to talk with the company's manager about an urgent business matter. He went to the manager's office. The secretary said, the manager's in conference now and cannot be disturbed. But how can he be in conference uh, when uh, no one is in the office with him, asked the superintendent. I must see him now on a matter of great importance. You may come back in 15 minutes if you wish, said the secretary, or you may leave your message with me. At the present, he's not to be disturbed. The irate superintendent uh, pushed by the secretary and quickly opened the door to the manager's private office. After a quick glance within, he quietly and quickly closed the door, said he apologetically to the secretary, why, uh, he's on his knees, he's praying. Yes, he's in conference, as I told you, answered the secretary. Oh, listen, when you and I are in trouble, when you and I are in a tempest, there's something we can do, and what we can do is have prayer. Number two, and I know I'm going to get stuck here. Number two, heed preaching. <laughs> you say, no way. Way, verse 21. Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and have gained this harm and loss. A practical thing the believer can do to see the termination of their tempest is heed preaching. In verse 21, uh, the physician Luke tells us that the uh, captain, if the captain, the controller, that's the owner of the ship, the centurion and the crew had listened earlier, oh my, to the sermonizing of the Apostle Paul, they wouldn't, Brother Baron, have been in this chancy scenario. Someone says, well, I just don't see a pulpit anywhere in this narrative. And my plain answer is, I do. And it's in verse 9, Paul admonished them. Friend, you and I uh, can see the conclusion uh, of our calamity. And so it came to pass when we heed preaching. Now there's several important truths about Bible preaching the believer needs to learn from this scene. And it may absolutely shock you, stun you, and even surprise you. First of all, it's timely in its detail. Verse 9, uh, now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous. Oh, uh, a important truth, an important truth about Bible preaching that the believer needs to learn from this scene is it's timely in its detail. Saint, when, a, when in a spiritual storm, Tune in because God has a message from one of his servants just for you. I think about a week ago this past Lord's Day and what my dear friend Brother Teat taught in Sunday school and what Brother Tom taught in Sunday school, what was preached Sunday morning by Brother Teat what was preached uh, Sunday night by Brother Teat. I, I think about a week ago, uh, tomorrow night, uh, what was uh, preached by Brother Teat on Wednesday night. You see, God, in his goodness and grace, gave the man of God exactly what the people of God need for this juncture, uh, for this uh, instance, for this season in their life. And friend, what we learn, this is better than you're letting on, what we learn about Bible preaching from this scene is it's timely in its detail. Amen. Secondly, somebody dial 911, 
it's not touchy-feely in its delivery. <laughs> Verse 10, I perceive that this voyage will be with much hurt, uh, with hurt rather, and much damage. Oh, an important truth about Bible preaching <coughs> that the believer needs to learn uh, from this scene is it's not touchy-feely in its delivery. The preacher that really is going to help you when you're in trouble isn't wearing a sweater on the platform and saying after the service, meet me in the lobby for a biscotti and a lolly. Say amen right there. All oh, the preacher that's going to help you and going to help your family, it's never going to sound like he wears ballerina slippers in the pulpit. I'm afraid when it comes to some preachers, Dare I say it? Oh, you know I dare. Man, when it comes to some preachers, I mean, it's like uh, uh, they got lace uh, uh, on their Bible. They're effeminate. They can't raise their voice. They can't get with the program. I tell young preachers all the time, get you a preaching voice. Nobody is interested in hearing a preacher that sounds like SpongeBob, square pants. God deliver us from these Pee Wee Herman uh, wannabes. I tell young preachers, I don't care if you got a gargle with rusty razor blades for a whole month, get you a preaching voice. Amen. And all God's sweet little children said, Amen. they said, ouch, that's what they said. It's not touchy-feely in its delivery. Thirdly, it's tragedy in its dismissal. Verse 11, nevertheless, the centurion believed of the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Oh, an important truth about Bible preaching that the believer needs to learn from this scene is its tragedy in its dismissal. You'll always lose physically, and I'll always lose physically, financially, and far more importantly, spiritually, when you turn a deaf ear towards Bible preaching. Now, Brother Teat would never say it, but I'll say it. In the time that he and his wife have been here, did somebody say, go ahead and say it? I thought, I, <laughs> how's your wife? God bless her. And she didn't even know what I'm going to say yet. Uh, in, the, in the years that Brother and Sister Teat have been here, and, and they would never say it, but I will, you could fill this auditorium many times with the homes uh, that could have been held together and the people hear me tonight that could have been helped if they just would have listened to Bible preaching. It's tragedy and it's dismissal. Man, I've heard people say, well, it's just your opinion. I've heard people say, well, it's just your take. I've heard people say, well, it's just what you think. You better be real careful with statements like that, especially if it's in regards to thus saith the Lord. Preach on, Dr. Hamlin, preach on. Because what we learn uh, from this scene in the scripture, in our attitude about preaching, uh, is its tragedy in its dismissal. All oh, that every believer that is in this service would realize the important truths that they need to learn about Bible preaching from the scene are. It's timely in its detail, it's not touchy-feely in its delivery, and it's tragedy in its dismissal. Newsflash, ignore scriptural sermons <coughs> like water off a duck's back and an individual has just thrown out the welcome mat for a spiritual tsunami to wash over them, their family, and their life. Oh, listen, what do we do when we're in a tempest? What do we do uh, when we're in trouble? I'm glad the Bible tells us what we can do, and that is heed preaching. Number three, Hannah promise. Verse 24 saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given all all given thee, given thee all them that sail with thee. A practical thing the believer can do 
to see the termination of their tempest is hunt a promise. In verse 24, the physician Luke tells us that the apostle Paul has gotten a vow from God that he's going to stake by the time his life, limb, and even his livelihood upon. Don't miss it. In this day and dispensation, promises are not coming from the lips of God, but they are found between the lids of the word of God. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, no matter what goes right there, what you're up against, uh, I promise you uh, that there is uh, a promise uh, uh, in the word of God that not only seems to have your name on it, but it also seems to have the nine-digit social security number that you have. Oh, listen, when you and I are in a tempest, when you and I are in trouble, there's something that we can do, and that is hunt a promise. Someone said, Oh, Dr. Hamlin, that's a pretty shallow truth. Well, it may or it may not be, but I can promise you it's gotten me and 10,000 others through a whole lot of deep water, even though you may call it a shallow truth. Let me say it again somewhere. Let me say it again somewhere. Let me say it again somewhere in the scriptures. There's a verse that seems to have not only your name, but also, oh my, your nine-digit social security number on it for especially uh, what you're going through. In this very second, the king of Italy and the king of Bohemia promised Sean Huss safe transport and secure custody. They broke their promise, however, and Huss was martyred. Thomas Wentworth carried a document signed by King Charles I, which read, upon the word of the king, he shall not suffer in life, honor, or fortune. Shortly afterwards, Brother Teat, however, his death warrant was signed by the same monarch. Put not your trust in princes, was uh, Thomas Wentworth's last words. Hallelujah, child of God. We can solidly put our trust on the words of our King Jesus because he's never lied. He's never deceived. He's never broken a promise. And when you and I are in a tempest, when you and I are in trouble, oh, listen, we can absolutely, honey, promise. Number four, habituate praise. Number four, habituate praise. I'm stuck. Number four, habituate praise. Did I mention number four, habituate phrase? Preacher and I went to lunch today and we went to a Chinese restaurant. And you know when you go to a Chinese restaurant, you've got to get a fortune cookie. And my fortune cookie said number four, habituate praise. Brother Tom picked me up at the motel and we were on our way to the service and we passed a billboard and it said, I think, number four, habituate praise. Right now you just got a text message from somebody who knows you're in church, but they're rude and interrupting you and it says number four, habituate praise. Verse 25, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. A practical thing the believer can do to see the termination of their tempest is habituate praise. In verse 25, the physician Luke tells us that the apostle Paul declares to all those who are in earshot that they should be super excited. This, in fact, is the second time uh, he tells them to raise a happy hand to heaven, and I exhort you that you be of good cheer. Verse 24, friend, you and I can see the conclusion of our calamity, and so it came to pass when we habituate praise. The best times to shout is A, when you don't feel like it, and B, when it doesn't make any sense. We act, Brother Tom, like the devil is uh, omniscient, which is a great big long theological term for all-knowing. 
By the way, I've made a mental note to mention it every night and I've forgotten. I love the fact that on this platform, you can't see it from where you're seated, but, but the wires are just absolutely, uh, they, they're rolled up and, and they're the way they ought to be. And, and I'm, I'm just given to detail, the attention of detail. I can't help it. And I'm thinking at 60, it's not going to change anytime soon. And, and usually places I preach, it reminds me of that verse in the Bible that says it's the last days because there's wires and rumors of wires. <laughs> but not here, man. Everything's done first class, and I appreciate that. Where was I before the wires interrupted me? You know, we need to realize the devil is not, he's not omniscient, which is a great big long uh, theological term uh, for all knowing. Uh, the devil only knows for the time what we tell him and what he reads that we post on Facebook. And by the way, while I'm on that, let me go ahead and get on this. I'm kind of new, uh, Brother Barron, to, to Facebook. I, I've been on Twitter forever because it's sweet to tweet. I said it's sweet to tweet. And I'm kind of new to Facebook, and, and I saw the other day, and, and some of you right now are trying to think, now, do, does he follow me, and do I follow him, and was that me that did what he's about to say? Right now, that's what's going on in your head. And it might have been you, I don't know. And it wouldn't matter if it was, say amen right there. But I noticed the other day uh, on, on Facebook that someone had taken a picture uh, of, of their arm. Uh, and, and I mean, it, it, was, it, it was sores and, and, and they were oozing pus. And I mean, it's just absolutely disgusting. I looked at it. And, I mean, I don't mean to be gross, but I threw up in my mouth two or three times. Uh, and the person had posted that picture. And then they said, what is this? And I thought to myself, it, it, that stupidity is what that is. <laughs> Nobody ahead. We're, no, we're nowhere near closing in prayer time. That's stupidity. You know what was going on right there? Somebody wanted to milk other people's sympathy. Hello? Mrs. Teat, I said that the other night in a conference. I said, hello. And a lady about right where you're sitting on the back row said goodbye and got up and walked out. I can't believe Mrs. Hamlin did that to me. I can't believe she did that. I, I, I see people that, that they'll, toast brother, uh, they'll post Brother Barron, they'll post a, a picture of an ingrown toenail. And I, I mean, it's purple and it's red and it's blue. And I mean, green pus is oozing out of it. And they'll say, what, what, what is this? And I, I think to myself, you're going to catch me one day when I'm tired and, and about two days behind on my devotions. And I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. It's stupidity. And it's you doing nothing more than milking people's emotion. Preach on, Dr. Hamlin, preach on. How did we ever get any attention before social media came along? <laughs> I am John Hamlin, and I approve of this message. <laughs> we act like the devil is omniscient. The devil's not omniscient. He only knows what we tell him and what he reads on Facebook. And so the best time to praise the Lord is when you don't feel like it and when it doesn't make sense. And you want to keep that dirty, no good, low down, sorry, egg sucking devil. You want to keep him guessing, then just go through life praising the Lord. Last year when this coronavirus crisis, which now has morphed into coronavirus craziness. And a rabbit just, just ran across my outline that I've got to chase. A rabbit just ran across my outline. i got to chase them and shoot them and skin them and give somebody a pair of soft slippers. Uh, this rabbit just ran across the outline. And the rabbit is this. If you have not figured out by now that Anthony Fauci is a political hack, you probably think wrestling is real too. <laughs> Whoop! Goes right there. But all this started, <coughs> and, I, and listen here, I realize there's something to it. I do. I, I realize that there's something to it. And I, I had one of my heroes, 
uh, graduate from glory because of it. Uh, but at the same time, I've got to tell you uh, that uh, this uh, uh, Kung Fu flu, don't get mad at me, that's what the president called it, you know, the legitimate one. Uh, this Kung Fu flu uh, has been uh, exaggerated. Uh, it has been politicized. And now it is weaponized. I realize there's something to it. But when Mrs. Teat, this all started, I said to Mrs. Hamlin, I said, I have not preached victory all these decades to live in defeat now. And I said, if this coronavirus kills me, there'll be no undertaker that'll put a smile on my face. There'll be one there already. Oh, if we're going to get through trouble, if we're going to get through a, a tempest, you know what we got to do? We got to absolutely habituate praise. Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said, you cannot glorify God better than by a calm, joyous life. Habituate praise. Number five, hone patience. Verse 29 and I don't think I need to say this here, but let me just go ahead and roll a live grenade under a pew or two. Please, please don't come to the book table and say, now, Dr. Hamlin, did you mean in the pulpit when you said, let, let me pause for station identification. If I said it in the pulpit, I mean it at the book table. I mean it in the lobby. I mean it uh, out in the parking lot. I, I mean it at the restaurant. If, if, if a preacher says something in the pulpit, I promise you, if he's the right kind of preacher, he's going to own it and not back up. And I don't need to say this here, but let me just go ahead and say it. We do not argue at the book table. We buy books at the book table. And if you come to argue at the book table, congratulations, you have just purchased everything. You have just purchased everything. You have just purchased everything on the book table. And the price has skyrocketed astronomically. <laughs> oh, we're having more fun than a barrel of monkeys. Habituate praise. Number five, hone patience. Verse 29, then fearing, lest... We should have fallen upon rocks. They cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. A practical thing the believer can do to see the termination of their tempest is hone patience. In verse 29, the physician Luke tells us that the apostle Paul is simply pausing in the storm until he gets by the teeth clear direction where he's to place his next step. A person should put in the margin of their Bible next to verse number 29, N period, C period, N period, which stands for no comment or commentary necessary. Friend, you and I can see the conclusion of our calamity. And so it came to pass when we hone patience. This just in. When God puts the believer in a holding pattern, they are never wasting a drop of fuel Hone patience. Number six, hitch on to perseverance. Verse 31, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, he cannot be saved. A practical thing the believer can do to see the termination of their tempest uh, is hitch on to perseverance. In verse 31, the physician Luke tells us that the apostle Paul looks the most powerful on that ship dead in the eyes and basically tells them this isn't the time to jump ship, boys. By the way, for the child of God, it's never the time to give up on your marriage, your ministry, or other meaningful things in life. Friend, you and I can see the conclusion of our calamity, and so it came to pass when we hitch on to perseverance. Don't quit. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt, and you never can tell how close you are, it may be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. When things seem worse, you must not quit. Man, I love with that great Italian, and I'm half Italian, I love what that great Italian theologian said, Rocky Balboa. He said, it's not whether or not you can take a punch, 
It's whether or not you can take a punch and then return a punch. You know what that great Italian theologian was saying? He was saying, don't quit. 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 Man, wouldn't it be something to quit on God tonight and the storm be over in the morning? Now follow me. I'm not a meteorologist. And so I don't know. I have no clue. And by the way, most meteorologists don't have any clue either. (coughs) Did you ever notice every storm is, uh, I I mean, it's like the zombie apocalypse. Every every storm. I mean, just every, every weather. It's just like it's the end of the world times 10. But by the time I'm not a meteorologist, so I don't know where the end of the storm is, but I do know this. Wherever we are in the timeline of a tempest, wherever we are, we're closer right now, Brother Baron, to the end than we were yesterday. We're closer to, I don't know if you can be blessed by your own preaching, but I'm almost there. We're closer to the end right now than we were when the service started. And wouldn't it be, I mean, wouldn't it be terrible to throw on the towel? Wouldn't it be terrible to, to give up now? Hey, I got to, you, you don't know this. I've got to share it with you. And it's been on my heart since the meeting started. Uh, in the pulpit, uh, there's a hole about the size, I, I don't know, uh, of a baby grand piano. And, and I've been so tempted with my preaching handkerchief. You can't see it, but I can. I've been so tempted to play cornhole the whole time I've been preaching this week. So tempted. Back to the sermon. But man, listen, you, you, you quit on God now and the storm ends five minutes from now. You quit on God today and the storm ends tomorrow. You quit on God this week and the storm is over next week. Hey, you've made it this far. Wherever the timeline of the storm is, just stick it out. Amen. Stick it out. It's always the darkest <laughs> before the dawn. Hitch on. To perseverance. Number seven. Hold on to prudence. Verse 34. Wherefore I pray you take some meat. For this is for your health. A practical thing the believer can do. To see the termination of their tempest. Is hold on to prudence. In verse 34. The physician Luke tells us that. The apostle Paul told all souls on the ship. Don't skip supper. Friend, you and I can see the conclusion of our calamity. And so it came to pass when we hold on to prudence. Oh, keep your thinking cap on both in sunshine and storm. Think about this. If it's stupid, (laughs) think about this. If it's stupid before the storm, it doesn't become smart in a storm. And I've watched, uh, Brother T, God's people, some of the best of God's people get in a storm and lose their ever-loving mind. And friend, if it is stupid, preach on, Dr. Hamlin, preach on. If it's stupid before a storm, I promise you, it'll be stupid in a storm and still stupid after a storm. Hold on to prudence. Number eight. By the way, I probably should have told you, Mrs. Hamlin's my secretary. She has been for the 42 years now we've been on the revival road. And I'll, I'll prepare a message. And as my secretary, I'll give it to her. And she'll type it as I've laid it out, give it back to me. And she's been typing my sermons. I didn't say preparing my sermons. I hope you... Listen to that. Of course, they they won't say that on the internet later tonight. They'll twist it like they twist everything because they're electronic Pinocchios. (laughs) In Jesus' name. And so I'll give her the message and she'll lay it out just like I've laid it out and type it just like I give it to her. And she's been doing that for the teeth, I mean, forever in two days. And when I gave her this outline and she typed it and gave it back, this is what she said. She said, man, that's long. <laughs> Aren't you encouraged? <laughs> Aren't you encouraged? Man, that's long. Number <laughs> 
Number eight, hatch a plan. Verse 39, and when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. A practical thing the believer can do to see the termination of their tempest is hatch a plan. In verse 39, the physician Luke tells us uh, that the apostle Paul comes to a comes up with a strategy uh, for the situation. On a strictly personal note, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible because 99, hear me, 99, because 99% of all the failure in life or in the work of God comes because we've not had some type of a game plan. I love this verse so much. Big statement. That if I hadn't seen Jeremiah 33, 3, that's my life verse. Some of you, I've signed your Bible and you've been wondering since I signed it, what is that? What is that? It's Jeremiah 33, 3. I have a doctor's signature. In fact, you take my signature in life first, and he probably could get medical marijuana with it. <laughs> get a prescription filled. But if I would have seen, that's funnier than you're letting on. If I would have seen this verse before I'd have seen Jeremiah 33.3, then instead of Jeremiah 33.3 underneath my signature, it wouldn't matter because you couldn't read it. It would be Acts 27 and verse number 39. You say, why? You say, I'm familiar with the narrative. And the plan didn't work. Yeah, I know the plan didn't work. And by the way, congratulations, the plan didn't work. I know that. You you get five more minutes of recess. I know that. But they still had a plan. But see, they still had a plan. Yeah, I know, and I know you know. The plan didn't work. But my brother, what I love about this verse is even though the plan didn't work, they still had a plan. Getting a tempest. Hatch a plan. Get in trouble. Hatch a plan. I mean, take out a three by five card, get a plan, hatch a plan. You say, well, what happens if the plan doesn't work? Well, you know what? Rip up that three by five card. They make more than one and get out another three by five card and hatch another plan. You say, well, what if that plan doesn't work? Well, the woods are full of three by five cards and get you another three by five card and rip up the last one and Brother Robert hatch another plan. General Dwight Eisenhower once said, plans are useless, but planning is in Dispensable. Hatch a plan. Number nine. Hard paddle. <laughs> Verse 43, and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. A practical thing the believer can do to see the termination of their tempest is hard paddle. In verse 43, uh, the physician Luke tells us uh, that the centurion, to save the life of the apostle Paul, stops the soldiers from killing all the prisoners and orders them that can swim to start for shore. A person must note, that they do not hear Brother Paul leading a prayer meeting, uh, but they do hear the loud splash as they begin to breaststroke for the beach in this part of the Bible. Friend, you and I can see the conclusion of our calamity, and so it came to pass when we hard paddle. The 32nd president of the United States, you know, a legitimate one, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said from a wheelchair, when you come to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. Of course, you do understand that it is God that expects us to tie the knot. Hard paddle. And then number 10, and last of all, and I've been looking forward to this 10th point since God laid the message on my heart early this morning. Not only number one, have prayer. And number two, heed preaching. And number three, hunt a promise. 
And number four, habituate praise. And number five, hone patience. And number six, hitch on to perseverance. And number seven, hold on to prudence. And number eight, hatch a plan. And number nine, hard paddle. But, but number 10, and last of all, hope in providence. Verse 44 and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. A practical thing the believer can do to see the termination of their tempest is hope in providence. In verse 44, the physician Luke tells us that the apostle Paul and all on board make it to shore all soaked but still, Brother Teat, safe and sound. Here is what I call a golden nugget of truth in the gold mine of God's holy word if a saint could simply trust God in one of the most serious storm scenes on the pages of the scriptures then every saint of God that followed him can also trust God for the spiritual storm that they find themselves in in this hour. Now would you look at verse number 14. This storm is given a name. Brother Barron, you know there are some serious storms in the Bible. Serious storms. But here's a storm. It is the only one, Brother Tate, the only one that has a name. Of all the storms that are in the Bible, this is the only one that has a name, and its name is Euroclidon. Uh, that is an interesting name because in the Greek language, Euroclidon, uh, and I don't do this often, and I hope that you'll give me liberty to do it. When you move that, that word Euroclidon from the Greek into the English, I don't often do this. I hope you'll let me do it tonight. But when you move it again from the Greek into the English, that, that, that name Euroclidon, it means mother-in-law. <laughs> oh, you didn't see that coming. But I do want you to see that such a serious storm, Brother Robert, it has a name. And tonight the storm you may be in has a name. Tonight those that are watching by way uh, of internet, that storm that you're in, that storm may, may have a name as well. And in our storm we can hope in providence. <laughs> Closing with this, back in 2007, one of my heroes, who's now in heaven, who preached in this very pulpit, and many of you had the privilege of hearing one of the giants of our day, Dr. Sammy Allen. I love Dr. Sammy Allen. I call him a four-star general for old-time religion. In fact, if you don't like Sammy Allen, <laughs> I don't like you. <laughs> and back in 2017, I was holding a revival meeting in Dalton, Georgia. And Brother Teed, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade the blessing of it. This auditorium filled with, with $100 bills. Dr. Allen came two nights to hear me preach. He had a couple nights off. He not only came to hear me preach, but he brought, watch this, a pew and a half full of people with him, filled his uh, uh, Ford Expedition, uh, and apologized, Mrs. T, both nights, apologized to me for not bringing more people with him. Ah, he's one of my heroes. I miss him greatly. Tuesday night he was in the meeting. It was there Monday night. Tuesday night... I preached along the same line that I'm preaching tonight. Not the same message, but the same line of truth that we can trust God no matter what we're going through. And Dr. Allen would have been, uh, oh, he'd have been in his uh, late 70s, if not early 80s. And he was, on that, he was on that front row. And when I finished preaching, I took the invitation, Brother Teat, like I have this week, as far as I felt the Lord would have me take it. And fellas, I don't know, how, how far can I come down up in the sound booth? I don't mean to interrupt your ESPN watching. Fellas, can I come off the platform? Can I do that? Thank you. I got done preaching and I took the invitation as far as I felt the Lord would have me take it. And as I was coming off the platform to go to the front row, Dr. Allen, in his late 70s, maybe early 80s, he, he came off of the front row 
And he got to me, he got to me before I could get to him. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. In, in fact, I hope it'll be something that, that you'll never forget either. And Brother Robert, I want you to help me, sir, if you would. I want you to come. and I want you, Brother Robert, to stand right there. I want you to face me, sir, if you would. Just stand right there and face me. And, and what you're going to do is you're going to be me, and I'm going to be Dr. Allen. And it's the non-speaking part. Man, you got it down. I know you do. And you just stand there and look at me. And so I got done preaching, preaching all the same line that I'm preaching tonight, Brother Tom. Not the same message, but the same line of truth. We can trust God in trouble. And I started the invitation, took it as far as I felt the Lord would have me take it. And I came off the platform, and before I could get to Dr. Allen, who was on the front row, Dr. Allen got to me, older than me, he got to me. And you know by having Dr. Allen here, how many were here when, when Dr. Allen preached in this pulpit? My, what a giant, what a powerhouse for God and good. You probably picked up on the fact that, that Dr. Allen's generation, that era, uh, they, they, when you talk to them and they talk to you, they were really big, sis, on this thing called eye contact, which we're not really big on today. We ought to be. Amen. Yeah. But we're not big on it. And when Dr. Allen talked to you, I mean, he, he would look at you, and, and God forbid that you didn't look at him when he was talking to you. God forbid. And I, I think we need that. I think we ought to go back to that. And, and please, I, one of my heroes, I, I'm not, in no way am I thrown off on him, but he was a close talker. Can a brother get a witness? He's a close talker. I'm talking up to your grill. Close talker. In fact, if you don't tell him, and I hope he's not watching, leaning over the battlement of heaven, but, but he'd call me, and he was such a close talker that when I'd answer the phone, I'd even say, Hello? Hey, Dr. Allen. I mean, it's close. And I got done preaching, like tonight, ringing wet, looked like I got done playing in a lawn sprinkler. And I, I came off that platform. He got to me before I could get to him. And, and, and mind you, close talker. Uh, come on over here a little bit more. But the team wants to see this. Close, close talker. Met me before I could get to him. And he, and he took both of his hands, Brother Robert, and he put them right here on my shoulders. And, and, he, and he pulled me close. And again, close talker. I mean sharing the same Fruit of the Loom t-shirt. Close <laughs> talker. Always that way. And, and, he, and he pulled me close and he said, Dr. Hamlin, you and I may be in my car and, and, and we may be going down I-75, either north or south, it wouldn't matter. And, and you and I, Dr. Hamlin, we may get in a frick but we'll never get in an accident. Yeah. That's what he said. Hmm. Now, now keep in mind, stay there, Brother Robert. Okay. I just got out of the pulpit. I'm ringing wet. One of my heroes, how humbling, came to hear me preach. Mentally, Brother Tom, I, mentally, I'm changing gears. He's a close talker. He wants you to look at him when he's talking to you. And mentally, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to catch up. And I hardly didn't know what to say. And there was just, Mrs. T, the slightest pause. And Dr. Allen, if it's possible, pulled me closer and said it all over again. And he said, Dr. Hamlin, you and I may be going down uh, I-75, either north or south, it does not matter. And he said, we may get in a wreck, but we'll never get in an accident. And then smiled like a jack-o'-lantern on Halloween and said in Dr. Sammy Allen signature style, what about it? What about it? What about it? And then he said, Dr. Hamlin, there is no accident with providence. Amen. Thank you, sir. Let's give Brother Robert a hand. There's no accident with providence. And friend, whatever you find yourself going through tonight, whatever you find yourself up against tonight, I'm going to make a very simple statement, and I hope it will hang on to your heart. Romans 8, 28 is still in our Bible. And we know that all things, it's not a few things, that's not a couple things. Brother Barron, it's not a handful of things. All things 
work together for our good. To them who love God and are the called according to His purpose. And friend, when it doesn't make any sense to me, and it doesn't make any sense to you, and it doesn't make any sense to all of us, it always makes sense to God. Hope in providence. Would you look at that phrase? And so it came to pass. Now I've got to tell you, I've got to tell you, I, I love how this comes in the Bible, Brother Tate. I love the fact that, that this phrase is not at the beginning of the story, and the phrase is not in the middle of the story, uh, but, but if you've got the right Bible, it's the last verse of the chapter. And so many times we want to get to that, and so it came to pass. But there's some things we've got to do before we can get to so it came to, and so it came to pass. One phrase that'll get you through all the storms of life. You know, during this uh, coronavirus crisis, which is, I don't know if I mentioned it, has morphed into coronavirus craziness. I don't know if I mentioned that or not. <laughs> I was preaching in Dixon, Tennessee last year, and everybody was wearing those, uh, they're still wearing those uh, face diapers. Can't wait to read this one in the sword of the Lord. I can't wait. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I was on the third floor. I was preaching in Dixon, Tennessee. Uh, I was at the Holly Inn Express. Uh, and I was going to meet my driver to take me to the service that night. Uh, and we stopped on the second floor. And, and I was headed to the lobby to get a ride to the service that night. And uh, on, on the second floor, the elevator door opened, sis, and a man went to, went to get in the elevator. If I'm lying, I'm frying. He went to get in the elevator. He stopped. He looked like, I mean, he looked like he saw the death angel, and he pointed at me, and this is what he said. I quote, dude, dude, where's your mask? That's what he said. And I looked back at him, with the teeth, and I said, dude, dude, where's your mask? He was like, oh, yeah, I don't have one and got on the elevator. Absolutely crazy. Just crazy. The coronavirus crisis has morphed in to coronavirus craziness. Let me help you with something. This is not the zombie apocalypse. It's not. And if it was, many of us would be okay because zombies eat brains. We'd be, we'd be all right. I learned some things during this. And one of the things I learned, uh, I went, went grocery shopping with Mrs. Hamlin. In fact, it's, it's the most of her meals, most, most of her home cooked meals I've eaten in the 40 years now we've been married was, was last year during the coronavirus. Because, of course, my meetings, I mean, spring, for the teach spring, the calendar was decimated, absolutely decimated. And I was home more than I'd ever been in our married life. And please don't say amen right there. I'm coming out of this thing weighing more than when I went into it. One day by the time she was doing something and she was going somewhere and of course I was home. And she's kind of being stealth about it. And I, I picked up on it, Brother Barron. And I said to her, I said, uh, hey, you going somewhere? Oh, no, don't worry about it, no. She said, man, you got sermons to prepare and uh, you're preaching on radio and television and on the internet, and I would never impose on I said, I, I got all kinds of time. You're going somewhere, and you're acting like you don't want me to go. And she said, well, really, I don't. <laughs> That's what she said. I said, well, pray tell, where are you going that you don't want me to go? She said, the grocery store. I said, the grocery store? She said, yep. I said, why would you not want me to go with you to the grocery store? She said, because I figured out that since you've been home, every time you go with me to the grocery store, we spend $100 more when you go with me than when you don't go. <laughs> to which I replied, if this is the end of the world, we're going to have snacks. <laughs> say amen right there. We're going to have snacks if it's the end of the world. Well, I ate more of her home cooking than I've ever eaten and it's been awesome and weighing more coming out of it than when I went into it, which is not awesome. 
But, but there's, some things I, there's some things I learned, and it, it's probably something, Brother Teat, you know, and if, if you don't know it, Mrs. Teat knows it. And, and I mean, that's just something I never knew, but I learned it during the coronavirus crisis, which has morphed into the coronavirus craziness. I've learned that uh, on some jugs of milk, now stay with me, I'm going somewhere. On some jugs of milk, there's a uh, circle, Brother Barron. And when the milk is spoiled, watch this, the circle is popped out. And as long as the circle's not, for the time, popped out, the milk's good. How many knew that? A couple. I learned that during the coronavirus crisis, which has morphed into coronavirus craziness. And here's the application. You'll never find a popped out circle on the cover of your King James Bible. It's always good. It's always fresh. Never spoils. Say, preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying what worked for the Apostle Paul Amen. will work for me. And sis, what worked for the Apostle Paul will work for you. And Brother Tom, what worked for the Apostle Paul, it'll work for you. Because there's no popped out circle on this King James Bible. It's fresh and it will work. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. One phrase. <laughs> One phrase that will get you through all the storms of life. I wonder with every head bowed and every eye closed. People already are coming to the altar. That's it. That's it. That's right. Hey, this type of a church, this type of a meeting, there's no need for me to strap a GPS on your Bible and program altar to get you to come. You know where the altar is. You know what you need to do. As we stand to our feet, I'm not even going to ask for the raising of hand. As we stand to our feet, Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help tonight, that you'd help tonight my brothers and sisters to do what you would have them to do. And Lord, there's any number of messages that I could have preached on a Tuesday night of a fall revival meeting. But this was the message you put on my heart. And I pray that you'd move in a mighty way in this service. In Jesus' name. As Brother Tom by himself sings a hymn of invitation. God has spoken to your heart tonight. Something you need to do. Maybe you're here and you're not saved. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He was buried and rose again from the dead that you might be saved. And I wonder with every head bowed and every eye closed who would say, Preacher, I know that I'm saved and I know that I'm God's child and if I were to die right now, heaven is my eternal home and right now you'd lift your hand and leave it. I know that I'm saved. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. You may put them down. If you're here tonight and you couldn't raise your hand, as Brother Tom begins to sing right now, all that you'd step out and come, that you'd come. Christian, what about you? Something that you need to do. Decision that you need to make. One phrase. And so it came to pass. One phrase. That will get you through all the storms of life. I'm so glad that the Bible not only tells me how I can go to heaven when I die, but also tells me how I can live for God as I'm on my way and can get me through the storms of life. Maybe there's someone here tonight as our brother continues to sing a brother or sister that you know is going through a storm. Why don't you slip up alongside of them and pray with them like you'd want someone to pray with you. Not in a haughty or high-minded way.
But maybe you'd slip up next to him and say, hey, let's go to that altar and pray. Let's go talk to the Lord about it. One phrase, just one, that'll get you through all the storms of life. Pastor.